in this video I'm going to start on my discussion of the intestines and so the intestines are going to take several videos so there's going to be a lot on this in this one I'm just going to sort of introduce uh, I guess sort of the anatomy and physiology and then talk a little bit about the enzymes uh, in the intestinal tract in the next probably video or two I'll probably talk a bit about the microbiome of the small intestine uh, and I actually have this written here about that and so <clears throat> it says the small intestine harbors a complex microbial community albeit less diversity and abundance uh, than the colonic microbiota so 10 to the third to 10 to the seventh power of cells per gram uh, in the small intestine compared to the 10 to the 12 cells per gram in the large intestine and the microbiota of the small intestine is not as well characterized as the uh, microbiota of the large intestine then after a video or two on the microbiota of the small intestine I will start talking about absorption which will take up uh, probably the majority of videos on this topic as absorption of the different macromolecules and the micronutrients and things like that will take up you know quite a bit of time and so that will be the majority of videos but in this one as I said I'm going to talk a bit about the sort of anatomy and physiology in general here uh, and then I'll talk a bit about the the digestive enzymes in the small intestine so I have this picture here so this just shows you know where the small intestine is and then we want to look at sort of the histology of the small intestine which has these folds in it then each of these folds contains hundreds maybe even thousands of these uh, of these microvilli uh, and so we can actually well these are just the villus which contain cells and then these cells actually have the microvilli uh, on their surface inside the lumen of the small intestine and so all this sort of you know smaller and smaller folding going on just increases the surface area and allows for more absorption and so the small intestine is broken down into sort of three different uh, sort of functional units so there's is the duodenum which uh, I've also heard pronounce uh, duodenum or duodenum but uh, I tend to pronounce it duodenum and so uh, if that's not your preferred pronunciation then you'll just have to I guess kind of bear with me so there's the duodenum which uh, is a little bit more I think different than the rest of the small intestine but then the small intestine is also broken down into two units called the uh, jejunum or jejunum or you know however you want to pronounce that and the ileum uh, and so the jejunum and ileum are both very similar in a lot of ways there's not like a, a part in the small intestine where you know this part is the jejunum and then you know a centimeter over this part would be the ileum it's sort of a gradual change uh, but the the duodenum is first and then that turns into the jejunum and then that turns into the ileum which uh, that will be the last part of the small intestine before the contents go into the large intestine which I will not be covering in this video so this video is just talking about the small intestine so these are some of the differences in this table here between the jejunum and ileum so the jejunum uh, is the middle part of the small intestine between the duodenum and the ileum uh, and then the ileum is the final part so the jejunum has the uh, suspensory muscle indicate indicates the beginning and then the exact beginning cannot be identified which as I said is you know because there's that sort of gradual change from the jejunum to the ileum uh, so the jejunum is uh, a bit wider the ileum is a bit narrower uh, so the jejunum is shorter 
the ilium is the uh, sort of lo longest part of the small intestine. The jejunum has uh, thicker folds than the ilium. Uh, the jejunum contains uh, a larger number of folds. Uh, the jejunum absorbs fully digested carbohydrates, uh, and the ilium absorbs non-absorbed. So I actually have this written down here, uh, which came from the same website that this table came from. But it says the main difference between the jejunum and the ilium is that the jejunum absorbs fully digested carbohydrates and proteins, or the ilium absorbs the non-absorbed particles of the jejunum. So what we will find is that the enzymes break down carbohydrates and proteins into uh, monosaccharides and uh, and individual amino acids, but not all of them are broken down fully. And so, what the the fully broken down ones are are absorbed in the jejunum, and the non fully broken down ones are absorbed in the ileum. Uh, and so, this also says that it the jejunum contains less of the uh, lymph tissue. And so we can actually look at the, the histology here of the different parts. So this is the duodenum on top. Uh, this is the jejunum in the middle here. And then this is the ileum right here. And we can see that these, uh, that these villi here are a bit different. Uh, they, they appear different in the different parts of them. Uh, so the, uh, in the duodenum, the villi have this leaf-like shape. Uh, in the jejunum, they have a finger-like shape. Uh, then in the uh, ileum, they are uh, a bit shorter here. And so one of the other things to notice is that the ileum has these uh, pyres or pears patches. And so the uh, pyres patch uh, is sort of similar to a lymph node. It's a lymphatic tissue. Uh, and it's essentially uh, surveilling the contents of the intestine uh, for, uh, for sort of invasive molecules. So it's sort of an immune surveillance system here. And so if we want to look at the cells a little bit closer, so these are the microvilli up here. So this would be the inside or lumen of the small intestine. Uh, so this is showing sort of different uh, absorptive pathways of hydrophilic and hydrophobic or lipophilic molecules. And so what we see is, uh, and one thing I wanted to point out uh, here is this sort of uh, transfer of hydrophilic down between the cells here. So, uh, and I'm not going to go too deep into it because we'll be talking a lot about absorption in later videos, but uh, so this is ways that different molecules are absorbed. And we see that they are absorbed sort of through the microvilli, but there is this pathway to go between the cells. And that's important because that has to do with, uh, with this celiac disease or gluten intolerance or whatever you want to call it, where gluten uh, uh, in the, in the, uh, its small intestine actually moves down here between these uh, between these cells here, and these will actually then get picked up by these antigen presenting cells, so these immune re cells, and it actually uh, starts this immune response. And so we can actually read down here. So the figure, which is the one above, shows uh, the pathogenesis of celiac disease. So peptides, and so. That's important uh, too. I, I find that a lot of people seem to think that gluten is a kind of sugar, but it's actually a protein. Uh, so I think people probably mistake that because it starts with this GLU, so kind of like glucose, and it's often found in uh, you know like foods like bread and stuff, which are known for their carbohydrate content, but it's actually a protein. Uh, and it is uh, a protein that is rich in proline and glutamine residues. And so I actually have uh, glutamine and proline structure right here. Uh, residue is making them resistant to digestion by the pancreatic and small intestine enzymes. These peptides gain access to the lamina propria, which is sort of this area here 
uh, beneath or you know outside the lumen beneath these cells here. Uh, the lamina propria, the connective tissue layer immediately underlying the epithelium where gut associated lymphoid tissue or galt is. And so that's where, you know, this stuff would be uh, that makes up the galt. Uh, the galt uh, immune tissue is found along the GI tract. Uh, so paracellular transport, which is what this right here is. So para meaning sort of next to uh, cellular, you know, so next to the cell rather than transcellular. Uh, paracellular transport would involve the breakdown of tight junctions between enterocytes and cause increase in intestinal permeability. Uh, and so that's, you know, sort of where that the... Uh, you know, the diarrhea that often accompanies celiac disease when somebody eats gluten because it increases the intestinal permeability. So a lot more water is going to sort of leak into the, the lumen of the intestine. Uh, so once the lamina propria and enzyme modifies these peptides, making them more antigenic, they're engulfed by the antigen presenting cells. So these, these uh, APC right here which displays them on the surface bound to the major histocompatibility complex two molecules. They stimulate the helper T cells, so these ones here, uh, with cytokines that orchestrate inflammatory response. Uh, so I won't go through the rest, but essentially it, it generates an inflammatory response, which uh, can then cause tissue damage. And so that is what's going on with celiac disease. And so gluten is actually, as I said, a protein, and it's made up of two different kinds of proteins. So the gliadin and glutenin. Uh, so we have the gliadin and glutenin here coming together to generate the gluten. Uh, so the mapping of the alpha gliadin motifs. Uh, so these different uh, parts of the um, of these gliadin proteins uh, are actually detected sort of by different antibodies and things like that. And so that's what causes the celiac disease. Uh, and so I just kind of wanted to talk about that, uh, especially in terms of this paracellular transport of molecules. And so, uh, and so when those kind of slip between the cells like that, that uh, can actually cause this, or that is sort of characteristic of this celiac disease. Uh, but anyway, so that is a little bit about the jejunum and ileum. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit more about the duodenum here in detail, uh, because that's sort of the place where, you know, a lot of these like pancreas, these pancreatic enzymes and things like that actually enter into the small intestine. So we have the duodenum here, which uh, has this sort of characteristic shape. Uh, but the other thing to notice is this uh, major duodenal papilla, which uh, is sort of controlled by this sphincter of Adi. So uh, the major duodenal papilla is sort of where things uh, where things like uh, the the enzymes, which I'll talk about here in a little bit, in the bile actually enter into the uh, small intestine. And so we can look here. So this, uh, this right here is where it's entering into the small intestine. We see we have the gallbladder here, which stores... Uh, which stores the bile and the liver, which actually produces the bile. Uh, and then we also have the pancreas here. And so those all sort of go into this, uh, this single common tube between them. And then that uh, sort of secretes all of the pancreatic juice, which contains all the enzymes and things like that, as well as the bile into the small intestine. Uh, and I'll be talking a bit more about that here in a minute. Uh, and so once again, the duodenum does have these uh, villi and microvilli here. Uh, so I'll also be talking about, uh, so uh, where is it? So these cells of Panath, which I'll be talking about, and I'll be talking about the goblet cells in a little bit more detail here uh, in a few minutes. So let's talk about some of these things like the pancreatic juice. Uh, 
Well, I guess first we can talk about the hormones, which actually regulates the secretion of the uh, bile and pancreatic juice. So the hormones here and the ones um, sort of uh, that we're interested in primarily is this secretin and CCK, which stands for cholecystokinin. So the secretin is a peptide hormone. It's secreted by uh, the enteroendocrine S cells in the duodenum and jejunum. Uh, and it stimulates the production and release of uh, bicarbonate enzymes uh, in the pancreas. So the bicarbonate enzymes are what's going to uh, sort of increase the pH, so reduce the acidity uh, of the uh, chyme, which is sort of the substance that exits the stomach into the duodenum. And so the contents of the stomach is very acidic, and so you want to reduce the acidity, which means increasing the pH or increasing the alkalinity. And so secretin uh, sort of tells the pancreas to, uh, to start increasing bicarbonate production and secretion. Uh, so when chyme from the stomach enters the duodenum, you want it to quickly uh, reduce the acidity of it. Uh, and so it does that by means of these uh, bicarbonate enzymes. Uh, and then so we also have the CCK or cholecystokinin, which is also a polypeptide and it's released by the uh, enteroendocrine eye cells. And so this actually inhibits uh, gastric emptying. So you don't want to, you know, have your stomach just constantly pouring more into it. So after it pours some into it, this cholecystokinin will sort of tell it, okay, we have enough, so don't give us too much more. Uh, it also stimulates the production of pancreatic enzymes. Uh, it stimulates the contraction of the smooth muscle in the gallbladder. So the gallbladder, we want to contract the smooth muscle to actually cause uh, bile to sort of secrete into there. Uh, it also relaxes the sphincter of Adi, so we would want this sphincter to sort of relax so that, uh, so that the pancreatic juices and the bile can actually secrete out of the major duodenal uh, papilla. And it also enhances the activity of Brunner's glands, which increases their output of bicarbonate-rich uh, mucus secretions. Uh, and it also reduces the sensation of hunger, which uh, I talked about in the previous video on uh, regulation of feelings of hunger. And so I actually have here, so this is sort of a signal transduction of these cholecystokinin uh, receptors here. Uh, and I'm not going to go through this whole thing. So one thing to notice, though, that's interesting is that these, uh, this, this actually sort of uh, causes, uh, well, it stimulates these JNK, so these June C and these MAP kinase pathways here. Uh, so those are oftentimes known to be uh, known to be needed for things like stress responses. And so uh, it's not really that well um, that well characterized why these are sort of stimulated in, by cholecystokinin, but one can sort of, you know, maybe uh, anticipate that, you know, you're dumping all this very sort of caustic, acidic stuff into the duodenum from the stomach. So you would probably want a stress response with that. Uh, then, of course, the mTOR pathway, which uh, increases translation of different proteins. And so the proteins that we would be interested in here would be the uh, the uh, the different enzymes uh, that would be secreted by the pancreas uh, into our uh, duodenum. So we would want to increase translation uh, of these enzymes in the pancreas. And so uh, that is what the mTOR pathway would be doing. But then we also have these, uh, these transcription factors which go in and uh, increase tra uh, uh, transcription. So we're increasing transcription and translation uh, of these enzymes. And so that is sort of what the cholecystokinin is doing. 
All right, so let's look a little bit more at bile. So what is the purpose of bile? So bile actually acts as uh, an emulsifier. So an emulsifier sort of reduces sort of these uh, these lipid bubbles here in uh, in our well, sort of, it's a water solution, so the main sort of solvent in chyme is water, and so everybody knows that, that lipids or fats and water don't really mix, and so these bile acids are actually hydrophilic on one side and hydrophobic on the other, and so the hydrophobic side uh, is attracted to the lipids where the hydrophilic side is attracted to the water on the outside and it can actually reduce the size of these lipid bubbles. And so this cholic acid, uh, this glycocholic acid and this torocholic acid, uh, so those are just cholic acids that have these extra things attached. Uh, so, uh, so this has a glycine attached right here, and this has a uh, a taurine attached here, uh, attached to this uh, carboxylic acid here. But the thing to notice is the stereochemistry on these hydroxyl groups. So, in this image, notice that all of them have these sort of uh, dotted lines here, telling us that those are sort of pointing into the screen. Uh, and so those hydrophilic uh, functional groups are all sort of pointed in one direction on this molecule here. And so that's, that actually generates the sort of hydrophilic uh, character, character of one side of the bile acid, uh, while the side sort of pointing out of the screen on this would be hydrophobic, and so that would... Uh, be the hydrophobic side of that. So that actually reduces the size of these lipid, uh, these sort of lipid uh, bubbles here. And what that does is increase the, uh, the surface area. So our enzymes are, are dissolved in the water part. And so if we increase the surface area, then those enzymes can sort of come in and attack the surface of that much more easily. Uh, so that is sort of what the purpose of bile is. Uh, so bile, uh, well, the thing to notice too is that bile is made up of this, uh, this cholesterol molecule. So it's sort of a cholesterol molecule that has been uh, uh, slightly modified to generate the uh, these sort of hydrophilic and hydrophobic sides of the molecule. So this is a, a cholesterol molecule. And so it's one of, one of the big things that cholesterol is actually used for is generating these bile salts. And the bile salts uh, are mostly reabsorbed uh, further down in the, the small intestine, but uh, I'll talk about that more in the future. All right, so then the other, the other component of the pancreatic juice are the enzymes. Uh, and so we see here uh, the enzymes in the pancreas are actually produced as these, uh, these zymogens or proenzymes. So trypsinogen and chymotrypsinogen and procarboxypeptidase and proelastase and things like that, which, uh, so those it produces it in those forms because those are inactive forms. You don't want the enzymes to be active inside the pancreas because then it will start digesting the pancreas. So uh, once it is uh, released into the duodenum here, then this enterokinase enzyme here will actually cleave the trypsinogen to generate trypsin. Uh, and then the trypsin will start digesting sort of the food contents, but it will also start cleaving uh, all these other uh, proenzymes or zymogens to generate the active form of these enzymes. Uh, so we can look at that here. So this is the exocytosis uh, of the different enzymes here. Uh, so I won't read this whole thing, but we can see that the cholecystokinin uh, and secretin are both um, involved in the exocytosis of these enzymes. Uh, 
So the exocytosis in particular of this, uh, this pro-enteropeptidase, which uh, is sort of the zymogen of the enteropeptidase, uh, which, is, uh, so, which is also sometimes called enterokinase. Uh, but anyway, so then this duodenase, which is produced in the Brunner's glands, will cleave the pro-enteropeptidase or pro-enterokinase into this uh, enteropeptidase. So the enteropeptidase is a type 2 transmembrane serine protease localized in the brush border of the duodenal and jejunal mucosa and synthesizes the zymogen pro-enteropeptidase which requires activation by duodenase or trypsin. So this uh, enteropeptidase will cleave the trypsinogen and do trypsin. Uh, the trypsin can actually cleave other trypsinogens, so it's sort of this positive feedback loop. And it also cleaves the, uh, the chymotrypsinogen and proelastase and procarboxypeptidases uh, and the pancreatic prolipase, which uh, so these ones here in blue are all uh, for breaking down proteins. The, the prolipase, uh, which is cleaved into lipase, is for breaking down fats. Uh, so it breaks down triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerol. And so we see, so we had the pepsin in the, uh, in the stomach, uh, which broke proteins down into large peptides. Then in the small intestine, we have these this trypsin, this chymotrypsin, elastase, and the carboxypeptidase is breaking down the large peptides into small peptides. Uh, then uh, within the cells, so after absorption, these amino peptidases actually break down the small peptides into free amino acids, which uh, can then be transported into the blood. Uh, but like I said, I'll be talking a lot more about absorption in uh, future videos, so I won't go too much into detail here. All right, and so we can look at the uh, the reaction mechanisms of these uh, different uh, these so things like trypsin and the carboxypeptidase. So trypsin is using this uh, this uh, catalytic triad here to break these peptide bonds. Uh, and so this is, uh, you know, we generate this, uh, this intermediate here where it's actually attached. Uh, and so uh, I won't go through the whole mechanism. I've talked about it in previous videos, but we have this uh, aspartate, this histidine, uh, and this serine. So this, uh, this serine catalytic triad mechanism, which uh, breaks these peptide bonds. Uh, then we have the carboxypeptidase catalytic mechanism, which actually uses uh, zinc here, which is bound to this uh, hydroxyl group. So we generate this uh, intermediate here where it's actually uh, forming this bond with the the uh, substrate here, uh, then we are uh, sort of releasing this hydroxide from the zinc to actually uh, attack the uh, the carbonyl carbon here, uh, and then that causes the break in the uh, the peptide bonds here. So they use two different mechanisms here for breaking the peptide bonds, but both the trypsin and chymotrypsin, uh, which use this mechanism, uh, and the carboxypeptidases use these two different mechanisms to break the peptide bonds. Uh, so uh, I talked about in previous videos how these lipases work. Uh, it's very similar to these peptide bonds, except it's breaking ester bonds uh, from the uh, glycerol and the, uh, the fatty acid. Uh, but we also have in the intestine, which uh, these are not released by the, um, by the pancreas, are lactase here. Uh, and we would also have sucrase, which breaks down sucrose, but it's pretty much the same mechanism. But I wanted to talk about lactase because this uh, is what's uh, sort of the culprit in lactose intolerance. Uh, and so we have this pre-prolactase, uh, which is cleaved into prolactase. Uh, 
Uh, and then the prolactase is export of the membrane, so it's actually anchored in the membrane uh, of the cells of the small intestine. Uh, so these, this prolactase is, uh, is transmembrane, and that's, that's cleaved by luminal proteases, so things like trypsin, for instance. Uh, and so then it, uh, is, it's cleaved from prolactase into lactase, which is transmembrane. And so that is what actually breaks down the lactose. So we have this lactose molecule here. Uh, we form this intermediate, so it actually binds to this here, uh, breaking off a glucose. Uh, then we break off the bond from this, uh, from this uh, glutamate here, and then it releases the galactose. So lactose is a disaccharide of glucose and galactose, where sucrose is a disaccharide of glucose and, uh, and fructose. Uh, but the mechanism would be the same here. And so people who are lactose intolerant uh, do not produce enough of this lactase enzyme. And so they have, uh, they have essentially this this sucrose disaccharide sort of free, uh, it's not being broken down, uh, but bacteria like, like uh, to use this as an energy source. Uh, and so the, the bacteria will use that as their energy source and then produce byproducts, things like methane and stuff like that, which is why uh, lactose intolerance is uh, often characterized by, uh, you know, causing a lot of gas and intestinal discomfort. Uh, so those are the enzymes uh, that are present in in the small intestine. Uh, there was one other thing I wanted to talk a little bit more about here. Uh, and so that were that was these two different kinds of cells that we find here in the small intestine, in the duodenum in particular. So first we have these goblet cells, and I've talked a bit about them in previous videos, uh, how those are, uh, are those secrete uh, mucus, um, and uh, this mucus, so we have this uh, mucus here, which is sort of shown in this peach color, uh, which uh, is, uh, is sort of a barrier that protects it from sort of the digestive enzymes, uh, which would break down, you know, the the cell membrane, uh, and you know the acid and things like that. Uh, but we uh, we also have um, these uh, gap formations. So the gap is uh, so I think I have that written here. Yeah, so the gap is the uh, cell-associated antigen passages. Uh, and so those actually deliver. Uh, so it's been recently found that the goblet cells can form goblet-associated antigen passages that deliver luminal substances to underlying lamina propria antigen-presenting cells in a manner capable of inducing adaptive immune responses. And so essentially what that is saying is that uh, different molecules here, so these antigens, so things from, you know, invading bacteria and things like that are sort of absorbed into these goblet cells and then brought into, uh, brought down to these uh, immune cells here. And so that can actually generate immune responses, which uh, is something you might want if you've, you know, had some kind of like, you know, food poisoning, if you've eaten something that was contaminated. So these goblet cells not only uh, maintain this mucus uh, this mucus layer on the outside to protect the uh, the uh, cells, but they can also actually bring in these um, these uh, antigens and bring them to the immune cells so that you can uh, start an immune response if you've eaten something that is contaminated. And so this is uh, uh, something that has only been sort of recently discovered about goblet cells. Uh, then we also have these paneth cells, uh, which are also involved in the uh, sort of immune response. Uh, and so the intestinal microbiota uh, can actually activate the expression of uh, what's called the MYD88 
Uh, so that is the stone here, which stands for uh, myeloid differentiation primary response 88. Uh, so it uh, activates expression of these MYD88 dependent antimicrobial program PANETH cells. Uh, and so the MYD88 gene provides instructions for making protein involved in signaling within immune responses. And so what that essentially means, uh, so you can see here we have the MYD88 uh, right here. And so it actually acts as sort of an adapter between these toll-like receptor uh, receptors here and these other proteins. So it, it acts as a uh, an adapter that sort of sort of, uh, I guess, communicates the signal from these toll-like receptors which bind to, uh, which bind to uh, things like, um, like what are called pattern recognition uh, receptors. And so, well, TLR toll-like receptors are pattern recognition receptors. And they, they bind to antigens and things like that, so things from bacteria. And so that's sort of communicating into the cell that there is sort of, you know, something in the, the intestine that shouldn't be there. And so this MYD88 is an adapter protein, and so that actually sort of uh, communicates that signal to these other proteins here, which then go down into the nucleus here uh, to generate, uh, to act as transcription factors to generate cell responses to that. And so this is innate immunity, uh, which the, uh, as I said, the MYD88 plays a pivotal role in the toll-like receptors, uh, which are part of the pattern recognition receptors. Uh, so in general, these receptors sense common patterns which are shared by various pathogens. Uh, and so we have these luminal bacteria here. Uh, so those are uh, the, the um, these uh, sort of molecules bind to these toll-like receptors and the MYD88 uh, sort of signals to these uh, these transcription factors which uh, then uh, start these uh, antimicrobial programs. And so the PANETH cells, uh, the paper I found on this said that the MYD88 expression is sufficient to limit uh, mucosal penetration by both commensal and pathogenic bacteria. So commensal being uh, sort of the bacteria, the the microbiome bacteria, and then pathogenic being sort of invasive bacteria. But the, you know, the commensal uh, bacteria would also, if we uh, didn't have this protection, might cause damage to these cells as well. Uh, and so you want to protect against both the commensal and the pathogenic bacteria. And so if you remember, uh, where was that? I think I had this up here. Yeah, so it was this. So we had the these cells of Paneth down here, and we had our goblet cells up here, which, uh, as I said, as I've been talking about, they're, they are both involved in sort of immune responses within the, uh, the, the small intestine. Uh, but anyway, that is just a little bit of the sort of anatomy and physiology of the small intestine. Uh, like I said, in the next video or two, I'll be talking a little bit more about the microbiome of the small intestine uh, in the further future, I'll make uh, separate videos about the microbiome of the large intestine or colon. Uh, and then after that, I'll make, it'll probably be a series of several videos. Uh, after I talk about the small intestine microbiome, I'll talk a bit about absorption of the different uh, minerals and the micronutrients and the macronutrients and things like that. So that will cover quite a few videos before I get to the large intestine and what that does. Then after that, you know, I'll get into sort of transport of nutrients via the blood. Uh, and then after that, we'll get into, you know, things like, uh, like the actual metabolism. So things like glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and things like that. But anyway, that's sort of the plan for the future. Uh, I hope you found this video 
uh, interesting and helpful in your attempt to understand this material, uh, and I will see you in another video.